Gerch. Um, I'm, going, I'm happy to welcome Johanna Tuber, who is currently a visiting fellow at our institute, the Institute of Contemporary History. Uh, she is a research fellow and a PhD student in Tübingen, where she is also finishing her PhD with the working title Art, Ethnography, and the Secret Life of Things, Petersburg, 1890 to 1920, focusing on a corpus of ethnographic objects that were photographed and declared to be primitive art. Um, in the early 1910s, by the Russian Latvian artist and other art historian, Wurdermans Mateis, by the pen name Vladimir Narko. Um, she will present a paper called Colonialism, Empire, and Time in the Writings and Photographs of Vladimir Markov. So, Johanna, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Nisa. <laughs> Thank you very much um, for the kind introduction and for the possibility to project and um, to present my project here. I'm very much looking forward to presenting and also discussing with you afterwards. So I will start with a um, short disclaimer. My sources um, contain both racist ideas and language, and I will use the N-word in self-preferential usage and in the original Russian title of my source. Otherwise, I will omit historical refer references to the N-word. That said, I want to start. <laughs> so welcome to my lecture. It's called Colonialism, Empire, and Time in the Writings and Photographs of Vladimir Markov. And we go straight in. In Dakar, in April 1966, a Soviet delegation presented Leopold Senghor, president of the newly independent Senegal, with a book that they claimed to be the first on African art. Its author was the Latvian-Russian artist Vladimir Markov, and its title was Iskustva Nigrov, Art of the N-Word. The context of this unusual present was the first festival of Negro arts, a large festival that took place during the whole month of April 1966 in Dakar. The festival had been planned for years, by the most celebrated and popular heads of the Negritude movement, Leopold Senghor, Alion Diop, Aimé Césaire. Its aim was to bring together the best artists and artworks from Africa and the diaspora to celebrate the finest of African arts on African soil for the first time. When I first encountered this information that um, Marcos' writings were brought to Dakar, I wondered how Marco's book, Iskustva Negrov, was received by this transnational African audience. Looking at Senegalese newspapers like Dakar Matin or Bingo, a cultural magazine that had published the first official call for restitution in 1965, you can see its cover, um, or yeah, one page in the middle, I will come back to this. <laughs> I could find out little about this question. In Soviet newspapers, on the contrary, the presentation and handing over of Iskustva Negrov was celebrated as sensation and as the number one news of the festival. One of these articles you can see on the right of the PowerPoint with the heading Sensation in Dakar. This begs the question, what kind of a book was Iskustva Negrov? And who was Vladimir Markov? What objects were part of that book that the delegation presented in Dakar in the context of a festival looking for the roots of African identity and culture, a festival that claimed to bring back African objects from European collections for the first time? For the remainder of my presentation, I want to give you a short overview of my project. I will begin with a quick note on biographical information on Markov, and the circumstances in which he wrote Iskustva Negrov and two other manuscripts on non-European art. I will briefly explain how I used Latour's actor network theory and the history of knowledge as a methodology to make sense of my sources. Then I will give a succinct overview of the layers of meaning that were inscribed to the objects that Markov presents in different contexts. My PhD project analyzes the first Russian writings on African, Oceanic, and Northern Asian art, in addition to focusing on the objects portrayed in them. All of the textual sources were written by the artist, art critic, and art theorist Vladimir Markov, whom you see on the right-hand side, who was born in Riga in 1877 and emigrated to Petersburg in 1905. 
In the following years, Markov entered the Imperial Academy of Arts in Petersburg and became part of the vibrant art scene, staging exhibitions, founding art groups, and organizing lectures and other cultural events. Markov was well connected with actors like Kazmir Malevich, Natalia Goncharova, or Mikhail Larionov, who later came to be known as the Russian avant-garde. In the summer months of 1912, he traveled to Paris and several German cities. Not only did he get in touch with the artists of Der Blaue Reiter, the Blue Rider, and visit the ateliers of Picasso and Matisse, but Markov also extensively read ethnographic research literature and visited the Trocadero in Paris and other ethnographic collections on these journeys. In 1913, he came back to take photographs in the ethnographic collections he had visited in 1912, while exploring also more collections in Northern Europe. On the PowerPoint, you can see the 11 um, collections that Markov visited during his trip in 1913. In only one month, he managed to document about 123 objects in 11 different European collections. In contrast to the year prior, he was not alone this time. His friend and partner, the artist Barbara Bugnova, accompanied him and was involved in taking the photographs. In the months following their return, Markov wrote the manuscripts of three books. The book on the art of Oceania was published under the title Art of Easter Islands in early 1914. It was the only publication that Markov personally witnessed to completion. In March 1914, he suddenly died of peritonitis at the age of only 37. The book on the art of Africa, Iskustra Nigrov, was published by his partner Vavra Bugnova in 1919. The third book on the art of Northern Asia got lost in the turmoil of revolution and civil war. The only things that were salvaged from this planned publication were the photographs taken by Markov and Bugnova. I want to tell you now something about the research, oh, sorry, research questions and corpus. While I was reading Markov's two books on African and Oceanic art for the first time, I had the impression that there was a lot of ethnography in these art books. Markov not only encountered the objects he portrayed as art in ethnographic collections, but he also incorporated a lot of ethnographic research literature in his own writings. To understand why Markov was so fascinated with those objects, I decided it would be very helpful to know more about them and to look at their contexts and meanings in imperial and colonial, colonial ethnography. As a result, I went to Latvia where the photographs that Markov and Bugnova took on their journey in 1913 are currently stored. They are housed partly in the Information Center of the Latvian Arts Academy and partly in the Department for Manuscripts of the Latvian National Library. Combined, they form a corpus of 195 photographs of approximately 123 objects. I say approximately because Markov often took more than one photograph of the same object, and for some of the photographs, it's hard to tell if they show another object or the same object, including the back or a detail of it. Whereas the exact provenance of some of the objects cannot be confirmed, the corpus consists of 33 objects of the Amur region, so Eastern Siberia, which you see over here, yeah. <laughs> um, nine objects of Rapa Nui, so Easter Island, 10 more objects of other islands within Oceania, including Hawaii, New Zealand, New Guinea, the New Hebrid, and 71 objects from Western and Central Africa, which are now the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Republic of Congo, Mali, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Nigeria. I took the corpus of those 123 objects and tried to trace their paths back by asking, how did Markov encounter these objects? In which collections were they stored? And were they exhibited or kept in the magazine? What did their paths into the ethnographic collections look like? Do I know anything about their context of origin or the circumstances of their appropriation? In tra tracing the paths of the objects, I am interested in the meanings that were ascribed to them. These include practices, so how were the objects handled, narratives, 
in which stories do the objects appear, geographical and spatial surroundings. So for example, narratives are often created through spatial surroundings in the museums. I will come back to that. Methodologically speaking, my project is inspired by Latour's actor network theory and his dictum, follow the actor, as well as the history of knowledge. As I traced the histories of the object at the beginning of my project, it was very important for me to think about how to work with them as historical sources. Latour's actor network theory and the history of knowledge both understand the production of knowledge as culturally and socially context bound, a collective and open process, which only becomes possible by gathering different actors, including things. The focus is on the active construction pro process of the world by different individuals and communities. Cognition and knowledge are thus no longer absolute categories, but can only be determined relationally. Moreover, it is very important to explicitly state here that knowledge is by no means equivalent to truth. <laughs> Quite on the contrary. As you will see, the idea of evolutionist anthropology, which became a core element of the scientific production and justification of racism, plays a significant role in my project. The co-production of knowledge between human and non-human actors has become very obvious to me in the context that I examine. These include imperial ethnography, as well as the context of the museums and the sphere of art, in all of which the interaction with things and constructing meaning is crucial. Using this knowledge historical perspective, I fundamentally ask about the concrete material conditions of this knowledge production, in which surroundings did it take place, how was knowledge produced, stored, preserved, transmitted, transformed? Knowledge should not be described abstractly, but in its con concrete material and local contexts. Objects are particularly su suitable for this end of war because in the handling, meaning, and evaluation of the objects, I can expose the fault lines and similarities and differences of epistemologies. In tracing the histories and paths of the objects, I discovered that two ethnographic aspects seem to be crucial to Markov. One, he seemed to see in the object something primordial, elemental of universal validity or significance. I figured this perception had a lot to do with the idea of the so-called primitive. As the idea of the primitive is basically a temporal concept, I consequently decided to look at how the objects became related to time in imperial ethnography, museological representation and art. This leads me to the second aspect that is apparent in Markov's texts. He seemed to perceive the objects as if they had another ontological status than most of both art and material culture. In other words, he seemed to view the objects not actually just as objects, but more in a position as subjects. Based on my discoveries about Marco's perceptions, I decided to also examine the changing ontological status of the objects throughout their journeys, from their context of origin to specimen of imperial ethnography displayed within ethnographic exhibits in museums and as art objects. And this led me to ask, were these objects seen as dead or alive? Did they have any agency? Were they looked at as representations of something else, or on the contrary, as having something like a presence or individuality themselves? I answer these questions through different settings in which I examine the objects. These settings also provide the structure for my manuscript. Empire, museum, metropole, art. For the remainder of my presentation, I want to give you a glimpse into these different contexts of the objects. The first layer of meaning that I can trace when researching the paths of the objects is that of colonial and imperial ethnography. Ethnography as a science took off in Western Europe as well as in the Russian Empire in the second half of the 19th century. It drew a huge part of its legitimacy from its role as an auxiliary science to better understand and control colonial or imperial subjects and facilitate the economic, infrastructural, or ideological subjugation of territories. Enlightenment inspired curiosity to become more familiar with places on the globe that were far away from a European perspective was also a part of this. But in the end, most interest revolved around what ethnography could reveal about Europe itself. 
With paradigm changing works in the natural sciences, especially by geologists such as Charles Lyell or Vasily Lamanosov, and eventually with the breakthrough of evolutionary theory with the works of Charles Darwin, the history of humankind suddenly seemed to reach back much further than the approximately 6,000 years that a biblical record had provided. The way this new prehistory was imagined and visualized drew heavily on depictions of South America, for example, depictions um, from the Humboldt expeditions and a bit later of Africa and Oceania. Here in my PowerPoint, you can see the first depictions of this new deep time that were printed and circulated through the Russian Empire, starting from the 1830s. But it was not only the vis visualizations. The way this new prehistory was described and imagined also drew, drew on ethnographical sources. Ethnography and the European appropriation of this new deep past of humankind became deeply intertwined. I find it helpful to term this process as a colonization of the past that worked in two directions. On the one hand, non-European history was measured and arranged according to a European standard. One aspect of this is what the anthropologist Johannes Fabian has famously termed as the denial of coevalence, which can be described as a way of seeing the world in which various contemporary societies are interpreted as literally living in a different historical epoch. Fabian has described this as one of the main paradigms in ethnographic writing. In saying, for example, Australia is where Europe has been before, is a forceful power structure that comes into play. I will come back to this example of Australia later. In addition, the object of ethnographic inquiry is not only transferred to the deep past and often depicted without any kind of past or change. Rather, this deep past was also imagined by looking at non-European societies and the emerging, emerging visualizations and depictions of the seemingly universal deep past where the imprint of these societies that were believed to be living in another time at the turn of the 20th century. To give a concrete example, evolutionist anthropologists around 1900 imagined the Stone Age against the background of ethnography of Australia, and we will see this in a concrete example later. Looking at the history of the science of ethnography, we can see a boost after the Darwinian Revolution in the 1860s and 1870s, all over Europe and also in the Russian Empire, ethnographic societies were established. Anthropologists like Edward Bernard Taylor transmitted the idea of a geological and biological evolution to the sphere of society and culture. Frequently combined with archaeological research, ethnography was seen as a tool to acquire information about the early history of man and helped to position Europe at the top of a linear timeline. Ethnographic objects acquired a meaning independently of their actual age as hints at life in prehistoric times. With their collection, it seemed possible to ethnographers and curators to lay out an archive of the unwritten history of mankind for which no written, written record existed and thus to save the European history from falling into oblivion. The context of empire becomes very visible in the writings of Markov. If we look at the context of origin and appropriation of the objects he portrayed, in all cases, their appropriation was in a very material sense enabled and made possible by the imperial infrastructures. It was the Trans-Siberian Railway or the ships of European companies operating in the colonies that transported the objects to the imperial metropolises. In many cases, this appropriation was connected to extremely violent practices of colonial rule and exploitation. The looting of the palace in Benin in 1897 by British colonial troops, which was connected to the killing of unnumbered civilians, has become the emblem of the colonial violence and illegit illegitimacy of colonial acquisitions. Two of the objects in Markov's corpus were looted in Benin in 18. 1797. You can see on the PowerPoint two photographs by Markov, which depicts those two objects that were looted in Benin in 
1897 and have since the early 20th century been in the collections in Leiden and the British Museum. As we can observe, the colonial imaginary of evolutionist anthropology at play in the context of acquisition of many objects that uh, also we can observe the colonial imaginary of evolutionist anthropology at play in the context of acquisitions of many objects that Marco photographed. For example, for the objects of the Amu region, the expedition and appropriation of objects is comparatively well documented. The director of the Ethnographic Museum in Petersburg at the time, Vasily Radlov, who commissioned the expedition, thought that an ethnographic museum should, and I quote, give a more or less comprehensive picture of the gradual development of humankind, end of quote. Concerning the expedition of, to the Amu region, he said, and I quote again, we have to hurry to complete the collection with the construction of railroads and factories. The old forms of social and economic life will soon be replaced by new ones." End of quote. The paradigms of evolutionist anthropology are moreover clearly visible in many of the ethnographic sources that Markov used for his writings. Here in the PowerPoint, you can see some of the ethnographical accounts that were used by Markov as the writings of Leo Frobenius. Frobenius led 12 expeditions to Western and Central Africa from 1904 on, some of which were funded by the German colonial office. Also, you can see the account of Wilhelm Geisela on the left, who was part of an expedition to Oceania. One of his instructions included to appropriate objects from Rapa Nui, Easter Island, for the Ethnographical Museum in Berlin. The title of Geiserler's account reads, Easter Island, a site of prehistoric culture in the South Seas. Accordingly, also in his writing, Geiserler depicts Rapa Nui in his account as a place whose ethnographic objects can give hints at life in prehistoric times. Now we will change the location from the global imperial entanglement of the context of appro appropriation we will take a look at what is happening in the imperial metropole to which the objects are transported. Here on the PowerPoint, you can see the Petersburg Kunstkamera. In the museum, the objects are assigned another identity and another meaning. They are no longer part of the everyday life of their context of origin. Instead, they become classified, get numbers, and are put on shelves and into cabinets. Actually, this is when things are turned into objects. The institutional history of the museum is closely linked with European nation and empire building. It is the place where the good citizen is educated and receives explanations about the world and his, her, their place within it. Objects make it possible to seemingly arrange and survey the whole world in a handful of cabinets and glass cases. They objectify the unimaginable vastness of time and space by making it visible, touchable, locatable, and controllable. In the museum, the objects no longer stand for themselves, but they function as representatives for a cultural group, for a way of life, or for a specific time period. From the 1880s onward, European ethnographical collections increased dramatically due to the efforts of ethnographers and colonial officers. We can also observe this in the corpus that was photographed by Markov. All of the objects entered the European collections between 1868 and 1912. Whereas a lot of objects were just stuffed into the closets and the magazines and were forgotten, forgotten sometimes until today, Part of the objects were exhibited and assigned precisely fixed places. The ethnographical exhibition not only played a part in the self-positioning of modern nations, both in time, space and time, but also in constructing the difference between the own, known and the alien. This construction and positioning of self and other through time can be observed in the museum guides and handbooks that Markov used. For example, in the handbook of the ethnographical collection of the British Museum from 1910, which was a source of Markov, 
in the introduction, it says, and I quote, many tribes at the time of their discovery were living in an age of stone. Consequently, their arts and industries shed an important light upon those of the tribes inhabiting our country in prehistoric times. In many of the collections I'm looking at, Australia was assigned a place this removed from Europe on the evolutionary timeline. Curators assigned objects from Australia a space within many ethnographic collections in the beginning of the exhibition tour. This is because in the logic of evolutionary ethnography attributed to Taylor, Australia was imagined to be close to the earliest stages of the history of humankind. We can observe this deeply racist idea in the exhibition of the Rautenstrauf Youth Museum in Cologne and its museum guide from 1906, which you see on the left on the slide. In the introduction of the guide, it, re it reads, and I quote, the exhibition tour begins with Australia, since here the lowest forms of culture have been preserved. You can see on the PowerPoint that the exhibition room with the heading Australia is placed directly next to the entrance. And actually the whole exhibition in Cologne was, was arranged according to this evolutionist anthropology. Markov visited the museum and photographed some objects in Köln. He also used the museum guide for his book about Rapa Nui, Easter Island, in which he constructed the supposed prehistory of Rapa Nui by comparing objects from Rapa Nui with objects from Australia. This temporal distancing to put the objects of Australia furthest away on the evolutionary timeline, no matter how old they actually were. I have the feeling I missed the sentence here, but okay. <laughs> and we go now into the next um, context, which is the metropole. <clears throat> the arrival of ethnographic objects within the realm of art in the 1910s was not a sudden appearance. Upon their arrival in European imperial metropoles, the objects already found their way into collections beyond ethnographical collections. At least since 1906, they were also traded on the art market, in addition to being appropriated in many other contexts. I will only very briefly touch upon the appropriation in the disciplines of psychology and art history, since this is a context that Markov also attentively explored. For its book, Totem and Taboo, published in 1913, is probably the most popular example of an ethnographic reading that does not only seem to reveal something about the modern man's prehistory, but also about his or their subconscious. Freud writes here that in generally modern diseases like nervousness or schizophrenia, the primitive ground of man breaks through. Where similar ideas exist already in the evolutionist anthropology of Taylor, in Totem and Taboo, the deep past was not only imagined to be present in societies, perceived as different from modern society, but also accessible in modern society and modern man itself. In art history, these links between ethnography and psychology were readily picked up. Art historians like Wölflin and Boringer wrote that so-called primitive man had the best intuition for the thing itself, the thing an sich in German. They defended their theories both with prehistoric paintings as well as contemporary ethnographic objects. Not only did they appropriate evolutionist theory for art history, they also ascribed to the objects in their writings more of a subject position. With the psychologization of art history, artist, object and observer merge. Woringer, for example, describes it this way and I quote, First in German, <laughs> this thing is nicht mein Gegenstand, sondern ich, which is difficult to translate into English. You could, could translate this either to the thing is not my counterpart, but it is myself, or it is not the objects that I am observing, but I'm actually observing myself in the objects, so to say. Markov and his circle of artists were very much aware of these theoretical discussions. In 1912, they were planning to publish a Russian translation of Woringer's Abstraction and Empathy, which you can also see here on the slide in their journal. Eventually, the translation was not published, 
that the impact of these discussions is visible in Markov's texts. In the objects from Africa and Oceania, Markov saw core elements of plastic arts of all times and places. Plastic arts are all art forms which involve physical manipulation of a plastic medium by molding or modeling such as sculpture or ceramics. For him, for Markov, they were examples of both an art of the past and of the future. They seemed to reveal universal laws to him. One of his arguments was that the visual language of the objects did not mimic reality in a naturalistic sense. For example, as anatomic proportions are not exactly reproduced as in a medical book. For Markov, this was the basis both for a true creativity of artists who do not have to slavishly represent outer reality, as he put it, as well as for a true artwork, which does not solely represent something else like an outer reality, but has its own presence or meaning. Finally, we're coming to the sphere of art, and I want to take a quick look at, the two, of Mark at two of Markov's books. How did he present the objects? How did he create for the first time and for his Russian speaking audience, the art of Africa and the art of Rapa Nui or Easter Island? In the book, The Art of Easter Island, Markov actually presented the objects very much like fossils, remnants or leftovers from a very distant past. This reading is evoked by the objects that Markov chose and depicted in his book. Most of the objects were actually made of stone. They looked weathered and as if in a state of neglect to the point that the former shapes of the objects are sometimes hardly discernible, which you also see on the photographs. Moreover, this reading is emphasized by the way they were photo photographically represented by Markov. Sometimes the quality of the photographs seems poor, they seem blurry and faded. The text in which Markov presents information on the discovery of Rapa Nui by European voyagers presents not only the objects, but the whole island as a remnant from other times on which deeper layers of material culture are preserved. I quote, it is possible that the primitive arts of Indonesia, India and China disappeared under the pressure of later cultural strata and that they survived only at a great distance from their home homelands such as on the lost Easter Island." End of quote. The usage of geological vocabulary that we can see in this passage, like treasure and strata, runs through the whole of Markov's texts. Markov presented the objects and the whole, of, and the whole island of Rapa Nui like a leftover from a sunken world. On his last page, he quoted another travel account writing, quotation, it is likely that the island is merely the remnant of a great continent once swallowed by the, by the ocean, like Atlantis. End of quote. Here we can see at least two things. One, that the ideas of imperial ethnography and museology and their colonial paradigms also informed and shaped the way Markov viewed and presented the objects as art. The significance that he ascribed to the object of Rapa Nui largely stemmed from seeing them as hints at the deep past of Oceania and Asia and the whole of humankind. Markov's depictions of the objects from Africa is a little bit more complicated. The objects were not depicted like remnants or fossils, quite on the contrary. Markov describes them in a way that makes them seem very much alive. Again, looking first at the choice of objects, Markov almost only represented presented anthropomorphic objects, a lot made from wood, some of them shiny and glossy from oil or polishing. Thus, they make the impression of well-tended and cherished objects. The photographic representations also different here, more artsy from different perspectives with a focus on certain details and in a much better and sharper quality. In the text, Markov drew heavily from the German ethnographer Leo Frobenius, which we saw earlier, appropriating his argument that Africa is not devoid of history. But whereas Frobenius described the history of Africa as a history of foreign influences, Markov used the material existence of the objects to argue for a native history and arts of Africa. 
We also use the functions and usages of the objects in daily life as an argument to assert that they were truly native and not the mere product of foreign influences. In describing the objects as beautiful, thoughtfully crafted and systematic, Markov offered a progressive reading for his time. At the end of his text, Markov critically comments on Frobenius and European colonialism. I quote, of course, this art is of another order to the realistic art of Europe, but is it not a valuable contribution to the treasure house of world beauty? And is Frobenius right when he ad advises that we should send European teachers to Africa so that they can teach the N-word to have a feeling for nature that is, that is to suppress their feeling for beauty, the ab ability to think originally and to deprive them of their fantasy and free creativity? This indeed would be worse than the work of the missionaries who just take away the masks that are used for dances and burn them." End of quote. Nevertheless, the impact of evolutionary ethnography is also present in this work of Markov. Looking to objects from Africa to examine the universal core elements of plastic arts still ascribes to these objects the idea that they were more primeal or, primeal or pristine. Also, the idea of the art of Africa is, of course, very essentializing. Although Markov acknowledged in the beginning of his book that he did not have enough material to describe the whole of African art and explained that he would focus on the western part of Africa, he still used phrases like the art of Africa frequently and conflated the words African, primal and primitive. Looking at his corpus, Markov portrayed such different visual languages as that of the Yoruba, the Luba, and the art of Benin, objects from a geographical distance of more than 7,000 kilometers and from a time period ranging from the 16th to the 16th century to the 1910s, as a seemingly homogeneous corpus representing the art of Africa. Here also the techniques of, photo of photography play a role. Portraying the objects in black and white in photo, they all seem to be of the same color and size. Through the way Markov always, always uses the same perspectives, angles, and focuses on the details, he opens a space for comparison in which the reader focuses on specific aspects in the visual language of the objects. This also encourages a perception of the objects as one related corpus. Okay, I'm coming to the end now. <laughs> um, in the end, it was maybe not so surprising that Markov's Iskustva Negro did not receive a lot of attention in Dakar in 1966 beyond the Soviet press. Whereas his book might have been revolutionary for his time, it did not seem to say a lot about Africa in the end. Rather, it is an interesting source concerning European discourses of self-positioning and the European interweaving of geographical spaces like Africa and Oceania within a visual imaginary of prehistory as a universal common ground of humankind. Some of the aspects that proved to be relevant for Markov also became big, point of, big points of discussion in Dakar and in the first restitution debates. The object's relation to time, as well as their ontological status. Instead of the deeply colonial imagination that these things, of these things that had been made ethnographic objects in Europe, could say, sorry, <laughs> instead of the deeply colonial imagination that these things that had been made ethnographic objects in Europe could say something about the early history of humankind. Now, their relevance for a Pan-African vision of the past was discussed. The objects of Benin were playing an important role here. Senghor, for example, in the context of the festival, repeatedly referred to Nigeria, the host country of the festival, as the ancient Greece of Africa. References to the epistemological status of the objects can also be observed in the context of the first restitution debate. In 1965, Paul Joachim wrote in the Senegalese, Senegalese cultural magazine Bingo that we saw before. Peep, and I quote, <laughs> people will agree with us. 
that it is equally insulting and also paradoxical for us Africans that all the pieces, all the art objects that will be shown at this festival, 90% of them should come from Europe and the United States. At the end of the festival, isn't it time to ask these countries to be so kind, to, to be so generous and instead of packing everything back up, to give back to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to free these black deities who could never play their role in the ice cold universe of the white world in which they are trapped. Currently, restitution is being debated for at least six of the 123 objects of Marcos, Marcos Corpus, but as far as I know so far, none of them have been returned. And with this, I want to close. Thank you a lot for a very interesting and informative lecture. Now, does anyone have any questions? Any debate points? Ivan? Here you go. Yeah, thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. Um, I wanted to raise a point about the imperial context of mm -hmm. fashion and imperial ethnography. So, uh, we have a uh, book by Gary Kortz, who uh, writes a story of very progressive um, ethnography, mainly done in Siberia. And I wanted to ask you about the connection. Uh, I'll, I'll give you more, more information on that, but I wanted to ask you if Mark was in, in any way connected to the progressive between the ethnography, or was he kind of more oriented to the West? Because uh, speaking about this progressive ethnography, we have former uh, exiles to Siberia, people like uh, Vladimir Bogoraz, uh, who, who so. are very marginal in St. Petersburg, but, but are very important for kind of this progressive ethnography globally, connecting to people like Franz Boas, right, with American ethnographers. And they would probably say that Markov is not a revolutionary, mm -hmm. he has very archaic views. So did he at all connect to this idea of living non-European cultures, or was he kind of a leader of German uh, literature, uh, kind of a visitor of European museum, totally oblivious uh, of whatever was going on in, in uh, Russia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a super interesting question. And I'm also often asking myself, like, uh, where to position Markov, like, if he's like uh, more <laughs> performing like a European, like almost Western European identity in those writings and so on. Because, I mean, it's very obvious that he draws a lot on like, rather the Western European sources, both from the like objects, like because of the um, collections that he visited, as well as the written sources. Because, yeah, like I told you, or like I, I showed to you, like from German and um, English ethnographic writing. So in general, I would de definitely say that what I can see um, from his uh, yeah, sources that um, he's heavily relying on the Western ethnography. And, um, but also it would be super interesting for, to answer this question fully <laughs> uh, to have his third manuscript on the art of the Amur region. And this got lost. So we don't know in the end. I only know that he was indeed connected, for example, to uh, Sternberg. So um, the objects that Marco photographed as a corpus for this third publication that got lost, um, most of those objects have been brought to Petersburg from Sternberg, and it's very likely that they also met in the um, in the museum. Yeah, and uh, so this is the only connection that I can trace to to the exile um, ethnographers of Imperial Russia, mm -hmm. and. Yeah, I, I would love to, to know more about this, but um, the problem is really like that the third manuscript doesn't survive. And so we don't know a lot about his, also how he would position the whole, um, this, this third corpus in relation to his two other books, right? This would also maybe say a lot about if he has a, yeah, um, equally like colonizing gaze on the imperial Russian uh, subjects or not, or if it's different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, just to let you know, you can also ask anyone who's on Zoom, you can also ask questions in Zoom chat. Nothing yet. Um, so let me try to phrase this appropriately to ask the question now. Um, so there was a huge movement kind of bordering anthropology and biology in the 19th century and earlier. Earlier, same with the phenology, later, name would be 
I think, friends in topology. So most well character of this was Cesare Lombroso. Basically, the whole movement of measuring skulls and kind of having a scale of who's closest to primates, and I think prostitutes and black people were down there pretty much equally. Um, and, and this has been heavily disputed and of course rejected very quickly in the whole anthropological and law scene um, in Europe. But um, it's, it didn't really lead the society. And I'm curious if there could be any indications in the ethnographical writings you were reading of the more biological part of ethnography and anthropology. Hmm. So actually, um... I didn't come across uh, it that Markov used also the physical anthropological sources a lot. Mm -hmm. I think this is mainly because he was interested in this more cultural ethnography, right? But of course there's um, intersections and entanglements between these um, two different approaches to ethnography because both are very much rooted in this evolutionist exactly. thinking. That's why yes. That's yes. So Definitely, like this has been intertwined heavily. Um, also, I was actually wondering, I don't know if you also see this, <laughs> in, the, um, in the way he photographs the objects. Sometimes I also ask myself if um, the photography of physical anthropology is also a little bit inside this, because there's also this, um, yeah, like different angles, focus on the head and so on. So, to me, this is a very interesting link. Mm -hmm. And for sure, I mean, he saw these sort of photography in some of the collections and also in some of the guidebooks that he used. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even, I think we were first again and then we got to. I can go. Um, I actually wanted to return back to the uh -huh. question of the context of Russian yes. colonialism and imperialism. Uh, because I find uh, Markov's choices of these three geographical locations mm -hmm. really interesting, but I don't know enough about Russian imperialism to maybe understand them correctly. So if you could uh, speak to this um, temporalization of peoples within the Russian Empire, so how Russian imperialism temporalized different um, um, nations and ethnicities within the empire, and then without uh, so beyond the empire, um, and thus to, let's say, to experts on late Russian imperialism, does it make complete and total sense that, yeah, of course, Markov, if he wanted to write about um, deep past, um, he would, of course, immediately reach to these three locations, or was there something unusual um, to his contemporaries about his choices? Uh, and maybe to ask a quick... <laughs> Uh, after thought or next question, um, could you say a bit more about how he perceived? Uh, you said that he saw this art as um, uh, revealing the past, but also the future of art. If you could say more about how uh, what he uh, said about the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, these are two very big and very interesting questions, and I will not be able to answer them fully now, <laughs> but I will try. So, um, because you asked about like the temporalization of peoples in the Russian Empire or Russian uh, imperial ethnography, and also about the three regions. So, actually, um, to me, these three regions are still uh, not completely like. Um, I, I don't totally understand why he chose these three regions. I would say also this um, is not only connected to the temporalization aspect, but also a lot connected to um, more your second question, <laughs> past and future of art. So uh, he was very much dealing with uh, Cubism at this time. And so this is, of course, also very um, important context, right? Because so, for example, um, he uh, was super interested in all visual languages that would um, not uh, depict an outer reality, like in a, a realistic kind of way, but really do something um, original. And he uh, perceived this, for example, um, in, in a very geometric um, visual language. So um, this can be seen in some of the objects maybe that 
this is not like an anatomic proportion or something like this. And that to him, this was exactly like the super interesting thing. And of course, this has to be also embedded in the larger um, contexts of the art scene in, in these times. So Picasso and a lot of other people in Paris um, were also super interested in, um, in, in vis visual languages beyond European art. And this is why um, Markov was also like saying that the future of art is, is like, yeah, um, for him, it is in these um, visual languages because he was totally bored <laughs> with uh, European art history and a lot of approaches that he learned in the Imperial Academy. And um, this is also a very interesting context to explore because there's also a lot of other levels playing into this, like um, social um, change in these years and so on and so on. So it's, yeah, many different layers sort of. And um, so just to come back shortly to your first question, also the, the temporalization. Um, so basically, I would say that at least in the um, in the Imperial Ethnography, in the Museum for um, Eth Ethnography and Anthropology in Petersburg, from like 1895 on, it was pretty similar um, the way people were um, <coughs> temporalized uh, because basically um, the new director was looking to Copenhagen and um, uh, some Western European collections and was also um, implementing the logics which he um, saw there and which made sense to him to the collection in Petersburg. And these were um, often um, patterns which uh, attributed a big status to the, to the material and to the form of objects. So for example, um, stone objects are more <laughs> uh, close to the origins than um, the, uh, I missed the word here in German, it's Eisen, like, um, Iron. Uh, thank you, <laughs> iron and so on and so for example, um, you can see if you read the, um, the, the guide through the Museum of Anthropology and Ethnography in uh, Petersburg, the guide after 1895, that this is a logic that has been implied um, on the temporalization. So it, it reads, for example, something like, ah, here and there, we have not found these uh, materials or these practices that are um, uh, needed for to produce these materials and so on. And this means this society lives still in an age of stone or so on. So I would say at least in this museum, it works quite, um, from 1895 on, it works quite similar, to be honest. But um, of course, there's also a lot of differences in uh, how imperial ethnography is working in the Russian Empire. Ivan was just referring to these exile ethnographers. This is a fascinating story. And there you can really see like that in this like first generation of Russian imperial ethnography, there's a lot of people who um, are really in attention to the imperial elites and also uh, really look totally different on their ethnographic objects than for example, in German colonial ethnography. So I would definitely say that there is also a lot of differences in this mm -hmm. and also in the different, uh, like, let's say, uh, the levels of uh, extreme violence that are sometimes, so I discovered this extreme violence in the colonial um, context, but not in the imperial context of the Russian Empire, mm -hmm. in the appropriation of the objects. So, yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of similarities, a lot of differences, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if your sources can kind of get us some information there. So do you have access to any of these personal documents or anything mm -hmm. like that? Uh, again, kind of trying to position the team between conservative yeah. European ethnography and uh, more progressive ethnography. Was he interested in vernacular and indigenous interpretations? So did he ever write to anyone, well, it would be interesting to take this object and ask a person from where this object um, comes what it means, because this is the question that yeah. Togaras would ask, right? Mm -hmm. If he found something, he would just go to the two yes. people and just ask, you know, what it mm -hmm. is, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Does he even ask this kind of question? Or is he situated within, let's say, kind of conservative academic 
field and the more progressive but still western centric aesthetic view mm -hmm. of the artist. So is he interested at all what people from the French uh, colonial context think about this object or not? So unfortunately, not that I discovered this. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, I have a lot of his, um, so part of his personal uh, sources got lost because um, most of it was actually with ba Barbara Bubnova, his partner after his death. And she emigrated to Japan in the, during the time of the civil war and left a lot of the, um, of these sources in the historical museum in Moscow, mm -hmm. where she was working for some time. And when she returned in the, I don't even remember now, maybe 70s or really like decades later, um, a lot of this um, was not there anymore. So part of this, it is lost. But for example, I have the manuscripts of him from his time that he spent in Paris in 1912. And there I can only see like that he read a lot of re like ethnographic research literature. But this was, of course, then mainly like the Western European ethnographic accounts. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any evidence that he ever try to engage either with indigenous people or communities or even to ask the ethnographers, did you engage and did you ask? I don't have any evidence of this, but thank you for the question. It's a very good one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sasha. I just would like to maybe, if you know anything about these like objects, I'd like to know something more about them. Mm -hmm. the specific ones. The specific ones. So the one on the left, yeah, um, is in Paris right now. It's even exhibited in the Louvre. Um, it's. Um, I have to take a look. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, it's an interesting story because this object is. Um, so it's a like these three are photographs by Markov, right? And this object that he photographed is actually not an original object, but it's a copy of an object. And I know that this is the copy because the original entered the uh, Louvre much later, actually. So after his, um, after his visit to the Trocadero, so at that time they were stored in the Trocadero, later to the Louvre. Um, but so I know that this is um, a copy of which he took a photograph and the original is from, made from wood and the copy is actually from um, cement or how would you mm -hmm. say it? Yeah, so yeah, th th I think this is an interesting aspect of it. And um, it comes from uh, what is now Congo and uh, is attributed to the Luba. So it's part of Luba art. The one in the middle also has an interesting um, background, actually a colonial German background. So this object was um, brought from um, German East Africa from a former uh, colonial um, German colonial officer to um, to Berlin, and um, actually he's part of the family of the National Socialist Göring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also an interesting story. And um, the third object is, and still the the object in the middle is stored in Berlin in the Ethnographic Museum, and the. Um, object on the on the right um, is from the British Museum and um, is attributed to the Mende, um, to Sierra Leone, and was brought in 1901 to the collection. Yeah. But do they represent anything, like some gods, or they were used, there were bigger statues maybe somewhere else, or what's so, their... Or their meaning or yeah, their... Yeah. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately about these three objects, really I don't know anything about how they were originally used. So the only, like the, the this is disappointing, right? To me also. <laughs> so actually the, um, the first layer that I go back to is the colonial ethnography. So the acquisition of these objects. And from these acquisition contexts, I cannot say anything um, about how they were originally handled. So this is something that I can say only about very, very few objects and about these three, I really, yeah, I don't have this kind of information. So for example, fr from the object in the middle, I only have one letter by Göring who uh, presents this object to the Ethnographic Museum in Berlin and asks if um, they want to have it. But this is all that I have 
um, for example, from from the context of this this um, object. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I want to say, like, I'm sure there's a lot more to be found out. Only that this is also like not uh, the the very um, focus of my project. So yeah, because like I'm looking at these um, layers of the colonial ethnography, how it's uh, then like transformed in the museum and then in the art. But I would love to know more about it also. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, I have two short ones. <laughs> I think one of them you already, maybe you already cautiously set the trap for, for the audience. <laughs> okay. The author sheet, right? Uh, because you mentioned mm -hmm. collaboration with his partner mm -hmm. and posthumously publishing these and so on. So could you speak a bit more uh, mm -hmm. about this? And the second one is actually um, more personal to your, um, well, it pertains to your um, research trajectory throughout your PhD and that I'd be interested to know um, how you decided to uh, go for the two. Uh, was this more, was it a more I guess a dramatic encounter where you felt like you hit an impasse or um, and were kind of looking for a new conceptual apparatus to go beyond or was the tool always lingering in your mind and yeah so how is this okay for you personally uh, how was it that you made? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first question to the authorship. Um, yeah, this is of course a very interesting question because so on the um, writings there's only the name of Markov, <laughs> but uh, in fact um, we don't really know if how far this was like a collaborative project, right, of him and um, his partner Vavara Bubnova. because um, as I said they traveled together and also um, they had been. Um, partners for a long time, like, yeah, for some years during this time. And so I, I really, I don't know how much uh, work also of Bubnova is in these um, writings. And this is especially interesting to ask this question also about the Iskos um, van Negrov, which was only published after his death, right? Because um, this was 1919 and uh, in the uh, foreword of the publication, it is explicitly stated that um, Markov did not have the time to finish this publication um, and that some, uh, for example, arrangements of the photographs and so on have been made by Bubnova. And so it's a very interesting question in how far, I mean, definitely she was intensely involved in the whole process, especially in taking the photographs and then also in the um, final arrangement of the, the second book, I think. Yeah. And then... Um, um, the question about Latour, so this is an interesting question. Um, also, yeah, because of, of course, like a lot, um, like changed or changes in the course of a long project, right? So um, actually, Latour was with me from the start, but not uh, referring to objects. So this was interesting because so I had read him in a university course, and I was very fascinated um, with how he destabilized. Um, paradigms of like modernity, let's put it like this, or the very idea of modernity. And uh, so I really wanted to use these ideas. Um, but in the beginning, my project was not really um, focused on objects. So I didn't really understand until, um, yeah, <laughs> the, the project took another course that I can actually use him much more um, in a much more material sense. <laughs> let's say it like this, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so many more questions from Zoom. From okay. Uh, she says, Hello, Johanna, best regards from Germany. Very nice lecture, and thank you very much. I'm very proud of you. I wanted to ask you if you also work out the photographs of the objects as media in themselves in your work. Mm -hmm. I mean, photographs always depict the past, but at the same time, they represent a certain immediacy or directness. Yeah, thank you for the nice question. Um, definitely. So the photography of Markov is for me also a very interesting um, layer of of presenting the objects, and um, I I definitely um, take a closer look. So this has really only materialized like in the past months. Before I wasn't really so much aware of this layer of the photography and what it actually does to the objects or also to the way. Um, 
we perceive the objects through his photographs, right? So, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of different aspects um, and I don't really know where to... <laughs> Uh, also, yeah, so I, I, I can just refer back to um, what I said in like the shaping of the corpus. I think this is a super interesting part of this. So that in the way he photographs the objects, he's really like constructing this corpus also with this perspectives of, of comparison and so on. But then also um, I'm super interested in this uh, aspect that you mentioned um, that refers to this time um, yeah, again, to this t timely aspect, because he really, um, I think, yeah, in the way he, he photographs, he really um, enables, uh, like, a, yeah, for the viewer to, to, per to perceive something like a presence or something like this. And this is also very much, I think, connected to the choice of the object, so that he um, chose to represent anthropomorphic objects and also the way he, um, the way he, he portrays the, the faces and the heads so um, there is a fascinating essay of uh, Strother, which is really focusing on this aspect. That um, so she says basically that in the history, like the the art history of um, African art, the um, photographs of Markov really stand out because um, never was so much attention attributed to the face, and that this also uh, marks like an individuality of the object, but also of the makers of the objects. Um, and actually in some of the ethnographic uh, writings at that time, especially these were points that were um, debated, right? Like, or which were, um, yeah, there were also very strong meanings on, ah, in African art, uh, the indiv individuality or the face doesn't play a big role, stuff like this. Um, and so his photography really um, sets another focus or, yeah, it enables the, the viewer to, to see something else in the, in the objects. Yeah, maybe like this <laughs> for now. Any other questions, thoughts or comments on the subject? If not, I would like to first thank you for coming and speaking to us about your research and then of course to all of the listeners both here and on Zoom. And we see you next time in exactly two weeks on the 15th. Thank you. <laughs>